Today, the Open Society Foundation and the Campaign to Decriminalize Poverty and Status is convening this conversation on counting the cost of exclusion, linking criminal law, political exclusion, and social economic inequality. So this seminar focuses on the use of overly broad and discriminatory laws that are rooted in the age of empire and misused by criminal justice systems around the world to criminalize those who are viewed as different or other. As a result, thousands of poor or homeless persons, migrants, sex workers, the LGBTIQA plus community, people living with disabilities, informal traders, drug users, racial, ethnic and political minorities, find themselves arrested, detained, and imprisoned based on their social or political or economic status. These laws are also increasingly being used to quell dissent and protest, targeting human rights defenders, climate activists, and journalists, to name a few. Today's panel discussion will shine a light on the various forms of exclusion and marginalization and how they tend to mutually reinforce one another. Uh, this has always been an important issue, no doubt. Uh, but has been made much more crucial now by the economic cost of COVID-19 and the millions more who are slipping into poverty and into the margins of society uh, by the ramifications of COVID-19. And I'm sad to say it almost certainly is bound to be made even worse by the political costs and the economic costs of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. More and more people uh, will slip to the margins of society. To help us deepen and sharpen this debate, we have three panelists, um, Dr. Balakrishnan Rajagopal, uh, Mr. Clifton Cortez, and Professor Sana Benachu. Colonialism helped to export vagrancy laws globally, such as the British Vagrancy Act of 1824, which was enacted with the intention of suppressing the increasing number of persons experiencing homelessness and the urban poor in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. The wide and imprecise definitions of vagrancy included not only sleeping in public places and begging. The act was also later extended to criminalize prosecution and soliciting or importing for immoral purposes, which was largely used to criminalize LGBTQI plus persons. Many European countries have introduced similar vag vagrancy laws which have provided the legal basis to imprison so-called idle or disorderly persons, etc. Mm -hmm. For example, the first human rights treaty that came into force after World War II, the European Convention on Human Rights, included in Article 5.1e, the right to liberty and security of persons, a provision allowing for the lawful detention of persons of, quote, unsound mind, alcoholics, or drug addicts, or vagrants. While Scotland managed to repeal this law in 1982, it looks that only in 2022, this year, we might be able to celebrate this infamous act being finally scraped, scrapped in England and Wales. In the United States, many cities tried to circumvent earlier decisions that I referred to by the Supreme Court by adopting regulations that are considered to meet the US test of US constitutional law to uh, again criminalize homelessness. As far as Africa is concerned, the campaign to decriminalize poverty and status made a comprehensive submission to me covering 19 African countries indicating that in most of these countries, vagrancy laws dating back from colonial period are still in force. In South Asia, anti-vagrancy or anti-beggary statutes were adopted during the same colonial period and are systematically used to hound and harass the poor. Part of what turns out for me is that these laws are not just colonial era laws, but that many governments are passing amendments and are passing new legislation that just makes things worse. And also another point that you brought out is that even when judgments have been given by courts of competent authority that decriminalize, you see central governments and even local governments trying to attempt to circumvent this uh, in, in different ways. Uh, I'm gonna speak specifically about issues of sexual and gender minority. Uh, and the, the, the issues that we're really, that we need to focus on are really about direct criminalization 
relative to sexual and gender minorities, indirect criminalization, and non-protection in the public sector. We still have 67 countries around the world that criminalize on the basis of male homosexuality. Many of those are colonial era laws left over, but many others are ones that have been brought in by uh, current modern day governments around the world, including in places where there was already criminalization and to increase criminalization. But most often we still see the absence of protection based on sexual orientation. You can be hounded out of jobs or kept from getting a job and you have no legal recourse because the grounds are related to your sexual orientation and gender identity. And so that really is what that third category of absence of protection is about, non-protection. So in terms of the discrimination being both direct, indirect, and just a failure or a refusal to protect citizens. Begging today in Tunisia is a crime on the, in the, the eyes of the penal code in Article 171 of the code. So being uh, poor means that you are a criminal and delinquent. This is the first example. And the second example, and I would like to be brief here, is the second example is Article 2. 31 of the penal code uh, in uh, force in Tunisia, which uh, criminalizes prostitution, which is considered as uh, a, a feminine crime. There are only laws and direct laws uh, which maintain people in poverty and criminalizes them later on. Of course, there is a lack of uh, jurisdiction. There is what we call judicial gap, but there are laws that do not uh, say anything but allow society to criminalize such be behaviors. What else do you think that the Human Rights Council and its infrastructure could do to advance the democratization, the decriminalization agenda? And when you look at us as civil society, uh, what else, what strategies should we be using? Should we be using to push and influence for change at the Human Rights Council? In June 2020, the Human Rights Council called in resolution 43 slash 14 on states to take all measures necessary to eliminate legislation that criminalize homelessness. So there is a basis for asking states to do it. While the UN General Assembly passed last year, last December, for the first time, a historic resolution on homelessness. And the resolution itself, unfortunately, regrettably remained silent on the issue of decriminalization of homelessness. Besides the UN system, the regional human rights mechanisms are terribly important. Criminalization of homelessness remains a serious concern in Europe and elsewhere. For example, in February 22nd of this year, the Danish Supreme Court sentenced a Lithuanian citizen to 60 days unconditional imprisonment for begging. The person was homeless in Copenhagen and suffered from drug addiction. He was begging with a cup in his hand by the Copenhagen Central Station. When the police arrested him in 2019, the Danish court argued that the ECHR had only outlawed begging bans covering the entire territory. In my view, there is prima facie a strong xenophobic element to this legislation. The figures so far confirm this as well. From 94 convictions under paragraph 197, 91 convictions were of non-Danes. Very important that we pay close attention to the opportunities, but also the barriers that exist at various levels, whether at the national or regional, or of course, at the global levels. The laws that I was just mentioning earlier related to sexual uh, and gender minorities um, are problematic everywhere in the world. Uh, and so even though criminalization, direct criminalization has been falling in developed countries, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, and it's also falling, by the way, in middle income and low income countries. So let's not make a mistake there. We're seeing decriminalization in some in, 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 in key places and some of the places where those changes have happened most recently are in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in spite of other places where criminalization continues and recriminalization or increased criminalization are threats. Um, uh, but in use of, uh, of, of, of indirect uh, uh, laws that indirectly target sexual and gender minorities uh, is everywhere, including where I live and where I sit in the United States. 
Um, and certainly the issue of non-protection under the law in public spaces is a problem in many, many places, regardless of country type. So there's a dearth of information, uh, data that can, we can use to push policymakers and very often policymakers want data. That might be an excuse for some to not take action, but they really do very often move on policy when there's hard data that they can rely on. We're trying to prove a methodology on the economic cost of exclusion based on SOGI. And we're particularly looking at the jobs, the employment market, um, to look see what those costs might be. Creating new evidence in the country to which you're speaking to policymakers that is about the country and its data that is specifically targeted on the question at hand. What is the economic cost of exclusion? Um, once we can prove that methodology, and that'll be over the next year, we want to be able to use that methodology in more countries that, uh, that are World Bank clients over time, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Asia, um, et cetera. We have a history, uh, uh, the bank, a track record of helping ca counterparts build this evidence base that ties exclusion, including under the law, to issues of po increased poverty, reduced human capital, uh, negative development outcomes for the, for the country. Um, and the future is bright for this kind of evidence building. The governments of the world as represented through their appointments to the UN, they all have an, they have an informal uh, grouping of countries that really do wanna move this agenda of equality based on SOGI, as well as the inclusive development agenda that is inclusive of sexual and gender minorities. So that grouping is called the, the Equal Rights Coalition, ERC. In Tunisia today, there is no jurisdictional control of these measures. The constitutional court has not been set up. The temporary court has been abolished, which means that today we are navigating, we are living in a country where there is nothing, I mean, really nothing, where the system has collapsed. The biggest opportunities are those that, that civil society has developed in an autonomous way. But I mean, really seriously autonomous. If there is a, a, a control power of democratic vigilance or watchfulness and solidarity, because it's very active, it's really Tunisian civil society. And today, and we have... A, you know, with the support of certain uh, agencies or, uh, you know, of the UN or of other, uh, other associations uh, of CSOs in Tunisia, we have been able to see uh, all the mechanisms, uh, all the observation and monitoring mechanisms uh, for democratic uh, surveillance that uh, are being set up by Tunisian CSOs. So it means that they, we are trying today to document in a systematic way, all the breaches uh, to human rights, uh, to equality, uh, to, uh, and which are based on gender discrimination, the poverty discrimination, and also discrimination based on the status of people. The opinion of the African court, of which uh, Mr. Raj spoke about, uh, was, uh, you know, for us in Tunisia, of a high, very big importance uh, in, in Tunisia. I've used it uh, uh, for all it's worth uh, because they give arguments, they allow advocacy to show what today in a country of Africa, we cannot continue to criminalize it. these, uh, you know, uh, petty crimes that uh, based on poverty and status. How do we make criminalization based on sexual orientation and gender identity more human. You can't. You have to get rid of bad laws. Uh, there are some inalienable uh, uh, rights uh, we cannot uh, give to uh, people just a small dignity or three-fourths of a dig dignity. We need to abolish these laws. We need to have a policy or a police or where you have prevention, where you have a, a acknowledgement of all people and where the central state and public authorities, whatever their level, be uh, responsible 
uh, for ensuring the development of all persons. We need to think outside the box a little bit. I would encourage civil society groups to think not only about other human rights networks or networks of other national human rights organization, but also other networks such as, for example, networks of cities and local governments, uh, a network like United Cities and Local Government, UCLG, for example. There's no humane way to deal with vagrancy laws. They have to be repealed. But the reality is that, you know, even if the vagrancy laws are repealed, there are so many other indirect laws that have been introduced. For example, you know, UK has the Anti-Social Behavior Crime and Policing Act of 2014 that criminalizes something called anti-social behavior. So there is no exception here except to say that constant vigilance is the only price of freedom here. We just have to assume that even if all the vagrancy laws are repealed, there are always going to be laws on the books that will criminalize and uh, you know make it very difficult for all kinds of marginalized people. I, I don't think we should overlook the difficulty of, um, of uh, collecting appropriate, verifiable, rigorous data. The legal frameworks are terribly important, but we shouldn't over sort of fetishize the importance of legal frameworks and repealing vagrancy laws for their own sake. There are other implementation challenges, even if all the laws are repealed. One of our objective, objectives was to continue building a community, com continue expanding the community. And I think that that has been done. We've got new faces, we've got new input. I think information has been shared, both of bad practices, but also good practices. I think ideas on further advocacy have come up in the course of our discussion. For instance, exploring the communications procedure at the UN special mechanisms where appropriate, engaging the World Bank group more and the World Bank group as a potential partner that we can work with, um, engaging this UN habitat process more, uh, and even the suggestion given by uh, Raj that we should expand contacts and allies for instance, with bodies like United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG. The poverty is a result of the non-implementation uh, of these laws. And sciences need to tackle the issue of poverty and not through the criminal code or criminal laws. The concentration of people in prisons is the result of most of people who cannot access the justice system they have received no justice. There is no justice for them because they cannot be protected. I want to thank everyone for making time for this discussion. On behalf of the whole team, thank you, goodbye, and stay safe.